At Online Med Ed, we walk you through every topic in detail so you're ready for the boards and the wards. The somatoform disorders are fairly low yield, but because they are so discrete in their classic presentation and from their translation from DSM-4, they're worth studying because you might get a question on one. The problem with these patients is that they are truly suffering. They're not making it up, but there's no organic cause, which means that there's nothing to actually treat. It is believed that there is some sort of emotional or psychological stressor that happened, some anxiety that's provoked by some preoccupation with something that's translated into a physical symptom. Not being able to find a cause for that physical symptom only exacerbates the condition. These are often associated with anxiety and depression. What I want to do first is review some commonalities in all somatoform disorders compare three somatoform disorders against the things you have to rule out when considering somatoform disorders. We spell out how DSM-4 has changed DSM-5 in the notes. I'll make a mention of it, but the emphasis is more in the notes there and just learning what you need to know here in the video. Okay, start off with somatoform diseases in general. The pathology behind a somatoform disorder is that there is something that has provoked a real symptom or some sort of distress about a disease. It is real to the patient. They're not fabricating it. They're not making it up. They're not pretending. It's real, but there is no organic cause. You can imagine this causes some degree of distress. Depending on what the preoccupation is and what the type of symptom it is will help separate which of the somatoform disorders it is. Whether it is pain, neurologic, or simply a preoccupation with acquiring the disease, you're going to have the same type of patient. So patients who constantly worry about acquiring a disease, that they might have something, or they have a disproportionate degree of a somatic complaint, are probably going to bounce around to multiple physicians. The reason for that is one doesn't do the job. They can't find anything, so they tell them they're crazy. It's all in their head. And it may be in their head. It may be some sort of emotional or psychological response to some stressor they haven't yet identified. But because they go to multiple doctors, they're likely to have many tests. And because they can't get relief from anybody, there's usually going to be some sort of anxiety disorder or depression. Now the absence of an organic cause for a symptom does not in itself represent somatoform disorder. It's more about what the patient feels internally. They believe it is real and there is no organic cause that defines somatoform disorder. And these symptoms are going to cause impairment. They're going to cause distress. They're going to cause the, the patient to have problems in their lives, even if they don't actually have a real disease. When you make the diagnosis of somatoform disorder, what you're going to need to do is first rule out organic disease. And you're going to have to use the history and physical to decide how much imaging you're going to do. But generally, when someone has a complaint, you're going to end up eventually doing some sort of imaging or blood work to confirm that, yes, there's nothing there. These patients might ask for things like medications or even multiple procedures. The classic is the gridiron abdomen for the person who has had multiple surgeries to try to rule out or figure out what's causing their pain, and really it's none. But when you have some of the somatoform disorder, you need to also rule out the other things it could be, such as factitious disorder and malingering. We're going to talk about factitious and malingering towards the very end of the lesson. Don't forget back to these. Because this person is bouncing around, accessing healthcare all over the place, seeing multiple physicians, getting multiple exams, and multiple blood works done, and probably having more anxiety about the negative findings or latching on to something that's positive but irrelevant to a medical professional, the treatment is going to revolve around psychotherapy and setting boundaries. 
psychotherapy because you want to get over whatever the psychological stressor was that induced the condition and also learn to control the anxiety or the preoccupation that, pro that provokes symptoms. In terms of setting boundaries, you want to ensure that there's only one provider. And that one provider sets the boundaries, the number of visits per week, per month, per year, the number of specialists that can be accessed, the number of tests you're going to get. Set clear boundaries up front and don't allow violations. But also it's important to have that single provider because what happens when they come up with a new complaint? Just because they have a pain syndrome NOS does not mean they can't develop a myocardial infarction. And if they're labeled as one of these diseases or disorders, someone may present with a real new complaint and be ignored. So the one provider sets boundaries so they don't access superfluous medical care, but also are there to be their advocate when something new and real happens. So this is somatoform disorder in general. What I want to do now is break it down according to the, th the three different somatoform disorders you need to know, and then compare them to factitious and malingering. We're going to do this based on the name of the disorder, and I'm going to use abbreviations here. They're spelled out in your notes. What symptoms the patient might have, what the preoccupation is, and what their motivation is. Why are they doing it? The first illness anxiety disorder is effectively hypochondriasis renamed. Illness anxiety disorder is going to have no symptoms, but there is going to be a preoccupation with acquiring an illness, despite repeated reassurance. The motivation is absolutely unwanted. They don't want to feel these feelings. It's ego dystonic and they're looking for your help. But because you constantly reassure them there's nothing wrong, they still worry about getting the disease. So this is the person who has had three colonoscopies at age 52. They've all been negative, but they're asking for another one because they want to make sure they don't have colon cancer. The preoccupation is with getting colon cancer, even though there's no colon cancer present. Compare that to symptom somatic disorder, where the symptom is going to be primarily somatic. That is, generally it refers to pain or fatigue. General complaints that can't be associated with some organic cause. The preoccupation is going to be with the somatic complaint. They don't want to hurt. They don't want to feel like crap all the time. It may be related to a medical disease. They may have a real medical problem. But if they do, it'll be disproportionate. To that medical disease. This also is unwanted. But the preoccupation is usually with the pain. And since they can't get relief from the providers because there's nothing wrong, they're going to be bounced around a lot. An example here is the guy who's been bodybuilding for 30 years and has arthritis in his knees. His knees hurt. Father dies unexpectedly and all of a sudden he's got chronic joint pain. Rather than dealing with the death of his father, he goes around seeking Lyme specialists trying to treat his chronic Lyme with IV ceftriaxone. And really he has arthritis and needs to deal with the death of his father, but he won't do it. The last of the three is Functional Neurologic Syndrome Disorder, Conversion Disorder. This has to do with a neurologic complaint. Yet there is no preoccupation. It's called a bell indifference. Most of the time they don't care that there is a neurologic symptom. This is often associated with an acute stressor and the neurologic defect is proportional to the stressor. That is, you see something terrible and you go blind. You had accidentally kicked your dog and broke its leg. You've never done that before and suddenly your leg is paralyzed. The person is not preoccupied with the disorder, the bell and difference, but they also won't hurt themselves. The person who's blind won't walk into a door. The person who's paralyzed won't trip and fall down the stairs. This is unwanted. But because it's a neurologic disorder, you need to rule out diseases like MS and stroke. But the cool thing with conversion disorder is that if you treat it like a stroke, 
you give the psyche an out by sending them to physical therapy, they may recover fully. So I want you to see these three diseases, illness anxiety disorder, preoccupation with acquiring an illness despite reassurance. Somatic symptom disorder is pain or fatigue, and they, it is disproportional to the medical disease, and they're, uh, they're preoccupied with the somatic complaint. And conversion disorder is a neurologic disorder, motor, sensory, that is related to an acute stressor. The final two diseases, and I'm putting a big bar here to separate these three from the next two, are factitious and malingering. These can have any symptoms. If you eat a battery, you're going to be suffering from battery acid damage. If you inject fecal matter into an IV, you're going to have septicemia. The thing is that with both factitious and malingering, unlike the true somatoform disorders, factitious and malingering are done intentionally with intent to deceive. And since it's done intentionally with an attempt to deceive, they can come up with anything, a psychiatric complaint, a somatic complaint, neurologic, whatever the case may be, they're faking it. What separates the two is what drives them, what the preoccupation is. With factitious disorder, and this is out of DSM-5, this verbiage, but it's the same concept. Factitious disorder is to achieve attention, to fulfill a role. The sick patient, the loving mother, the doting child. Factitious disorder itself is done to the self. If done by proxy, you harm someone else, usually a child or an elder, someone who's dependent upon you, it's called factitious by proxy. Factitious by proxy that leads to someone else suffering needs to be jailed. Factitious disorder itself should be confronted but should be treated with psychotherapy because they're not harming anyone else but themselves. And it's not because they want something out of that. They want the attention, the sick role that comes with it. Example of that would be the person who injects themselves with fecal matter in order to maintain septicemia so they stay in the hospital. On the other hand, the person who is a malingerer is doing this for secondary gain. Money, insurance, freedom. This is the construction worker who feigns a back injury and then goes works on his own roof while he's collecting a social security check. Or Walter White, when he went on his dissociative fugue. Check out the dissociation lesson for more on dissociation disorders. When Walter goes on his dissociative fugue, he says it's in response to learning that he has cancer. And really, it's in response to avoiding capture by the police. He fakes his fugue state to avoid capture. That's malingering. If you compare these all five together, IAD, SSD, and conversion disorder are unwanted, usually in response to a psychological stressor. The symptoms and the preoccupation separate them. Factitious and malingering can be any symptom because whatever they've done to themselves will be the presenting complaint. Factitious is to seek attention. Malingering is simply secondary gain, but both factitious and malingering are intentional with an attempt to deceive. Somatoform in general, remember, treated with psychotherapy and limitations unless it's malingering, in which case they go to jail. That, somatoform disorders.